This is Bob Capetta, Professor of Mathematics at College of DuPage in Glen Ellyn, Illinois. Today's lesson, Mathematics for Health Sciences, we're going to examine the confidence interval for the mean. To do this, it's important to understand the difference between a parameter and a statistic. A parameter represents a very, very large set of data. A statistic represents a relatively small set of data. But we're going to make inferences, educated guesses about the large set of data after examining the relatively small set of data. That large set of data is called a population, and a parameter is a number that reflects a characteristic of that population. So the population could be all U.S. citizens, and a parameter could be the average height of all U.S. citizens. Now understand that is impossible or impractical to collect that sort of information. At the national level, there is a census every 10 years, but even that is an imperfect process. So for that reason, parameters are almost never computed. But the power of statistics is about making inferences about parameters by examining statistics. So what exactly is a statistic? It represents a characteristic of a sample. And a sample is a relatively small subset of the entire population, typically. So U.S. population may be 350 million people. We may take a sample of size 50 to make inferences. Now for those inferences to be reasonable, it is important that we have a simple random sample. That is a sample in which every element of the population has an equally likely chance to be selected. If we want to know something about all U.S. citizens, standing outside a mall and asking the first 50 people that walk out a question would not be a representative sample. So there is a branch of statistics called design of experiments, which looks very seriously at how you properly randomize that. That is a relatively difficult thing to do. So just an example to kind of think about populations, parameters, samples, and statistics. If we want to know the average of all SAT scores for all U.S. high school students, we would need all of them to define the population, millions. The average of those folks would be the parameter. And it'll be difficult for us to get that, although the SAT Corporation would have access to that. As researchers, we may want to take a random collection of 100 students, and then we could take the average of that set. Now, the random collection is a sample. The average of that sample is the statistic. Now, do we think that the average for the sample that we might be able to get as researchers might be the same number that the average that the company would have for all high school students? My guess is they'll be a little different, and one of the points of this discussion is to talk about that difference. Now, it's important to know notation. We're talking about averages. In statistics, we like to use the word mean to represent an average, and we use these symbols. So x bar, x with the line on top, is a statistic. The Greek letter mu is a parameter. Both of these are means. Both of these are averages. But x bar is a statistic, so it represents the average of a relatively small sample, hopefully randomly chosen. Mu is a parameter, so it represents the average of the entire population, oftentimes millions of individuals. So constructing x bar is much simpler than constructing mu, for sure. But x bar and mu are never going to be the same, or virtually never going to be the same. So for that reason, we say that a point estimate is wrong. It's not exactly the same. So what we do instead is we provide an interval estimate, a range of values. We do not know what mu is, but we hope that it is within, it is within some range. So we're going to construct an interval, a low point to a high point, that we hope will capture the overall population mean mu. It will be correct, that interval will be correct, if it covers or captures the parameter of interest. And in our case, the parameter of interest is the average, is mu. So we need a formula to do this. And to do the t interval for the population mean, we use the following formula, x bar, the average, plus or minus t alpha by 2, we'll talk about what that means, times s, that is the sample standard deviation, divided by the square root of n, and is the number of items in our sample. So we get x bar s and n either from the data or from the statistics given, 
the one thing we have to determine is t alpha by 2. So we'll talk about how to find that. Now this isn't always fair. This process will sometimes lead to difficulties. So let's make sure we understand when it is reasonable to use this formula. Either n must be large. So we have to have at least 30 items in our data set. If that's the case, it is usually fair to use this model. If n is small, then we have to say that the underlying data set is normally distributed or bell-shaped. If we have a bell-shaped distribution, it is fair for us to use this approach with a small n with n of less than 30. So let's look at an example. And our goal here is going to be to find the 95% confidence interval for mu. We have a sample. Let's say we have 45 individuals and the average is 27.2 and the standard deviation is 8.32. But let's give it some context. Let's assume that these numbers represent the average number of patients that nurses in a certain type of ward may see over the course of a week. So if we have 47, 45 nurses chosen, on average they see 27.2 patients with a standard deviation of 8.32. That is just from a sample of 45. If we had all of the millions of nurses in the population, would we expect the numbers to be the same? We'd expect them to be similar, but not necessarily the same. So that's what we'll talk about. To do this, we need to have our degrees of freedom. Now, the t-distribution is key to our discussion here. And the t-distribution has uh, n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So n here is 45. 45 minus 1 is 44 degrees of freedom. So we need to look up in a table for a 95% confidence interval what 44 degrees of freedom will give us. So we can go to Blackboard and we can find the statistics table. And this time we're going to look at the T table to find the appropriate number. So we go to Blackboard and we look on the left for statistics tables. And sure enough, we find it right here. So if we click on that, you will notice that we have a Z table and a T table. And we've seen the uh, Z table before, so I will click on the T table and that will look like this. So we have the degrees of freedom in the first column, the appropriate T for a 95% confidence interval in the second, and for a 99% confidence interval in the third. For practical matters, these are the only two confidence intervals that are used often. On occasion, you may see others, but these are the most commonly used. So that's what we'll use on our table. We need 44 degrees of freedom. So we'll take it to 44 degrees of freedom. And the number we see here is 2.015. So 2.015 is the T alpha by 2 that we need for 44 degrees of freedom for a 95% confidence interval. So we have the 2.015 there for our T alpha by 2. And now we have all the information we need. X bar is 27.2. T alpha by 2 is 2.015. S is 8.32. N is 45. So b divided by root 45. So let's go ahead and plug those numbers in and see what we get. x bar 27.2 plus or minus 2.015 times 8.32 divided by the square root of 45. To do this, I suggest you do 2.015 times 8.32 divided by the square root of 45 first. And you should get approximately 2.50. So we have 27.2 plus or minus 2.50. That will be our 95% confidence interval. And it's important for us to know what that means. So we're saying 24.7 to 29.70 is essentially what we get. And our 95% confidence interval for the mean is 24.7 to 29.7. Now that means that the probability is 95% that this confidence interval will capture the overall average for everybody. So we have a situation here where we only had a sample of 45 people, yet we're pretty sure that we've narrowed down the possibility for the average for all nurses, number of patients that they see. But remember, the 95% confidence tells us that is a likelihood. We still may be wrong. 
So the probability is 95% that that interval will capture the actual mean mu for the entire population. In this example, we want to construct a 99% confidence interval for the, mu, for the mean mu. Let's say this is n of 25, this is x bar is 37.4, and s is 6.21. So let's say this is the number of patients that a dental hygienist may see over a certain amount of time, uh, maybe over the course of a week. And you want to see what that would mean if we had everybody. Now, n is small here. So the only way this is fair is if the underlying data set is normal. So I am telling you that we can assume normality for this data set. We can assume this comes from a bell-shaped distribution. We need our degrees of freedom here. So our degrees of freedom here are going to be n minus 1. 25 minus 1 is 24 degrees of freedom. And we want a 99% confidence level. So let's go to the table and see what the t value will be for 24 degrees of freedom with a 99% confidence level. 99% is the last column, so we will take degrees of freedom to 24. And our last column you'll see here is 2.797. That's the number that we are going to need for a 99% confidence interval. So we've got x bar plus or minus t alpha by 2 times s over root n. t alpha by 2 is 2.797. That's the number that we need to construct our 99% confidence interval. So plugging in everything, x bar 37.4, plus or minus t alpha by 2, 2.797, s 6.21, over root n, over root 25. We get 37.4 to 3.47, which is going to give us what? Uh, 33.93 to 40.87 is our confidence interval. Just clean it up. I had a few more decimals for t alpha by 2 up here, but I want to make sure I have the same thing you have. So we get our confidence interval of 33.93 to 40.87. This is a 99% confidence interval. So the probability is 99% that this interval will capture the overall population mean mu. We can't be sure, we're never certain it's there, but the probability is 99% that this thing, this interval, this range of values will indeed capture the overall population mean mu. So we conclude by saying the 99% confidence interval for mu is the range of values from 33.93 to 40.87. And that will conclude this lesson.